We appreciate very much the presence of each one here this morning. We'd like to welcome you to this Assembly of the Lord's House. I'm very glad to be able to be here, and I appreciate another opportunity to begin a series of gospel meetings. To start off this morning, I'd like to talk about a subject. I've written a subject up here on the board. We're going to talk about being thankful to God. And I'm going to use as a text uh, Colossians chapter 3. I'll read down there at verse 5. Uh, uh, the, uh, here we find uh, verse 15 it is. And uh, here the Apostle Paul says, Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you are also called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let me tell you something, friends. I find that the history of mankind, if you begin to examine it throughout the Bible, is a pretty sad commentary on the way people have treated God. As a matter of fact, most of the time when God has been so good to man, uh, almost invariably, man has forgotten to be thankful unto God. I want to point out this by using a few examples out of the Bible, and then we're going to talk a little bit about us before this is all over with. Uh, let me start back at the beginning with Adam and Eve. You know, Adam and Eve were richly blessed in so many ways. I find out that um, if you notice what happened to Adam and Eve, they were created in the image and the likeness of God. Out of all of creation, Adam and Eve were special to begin with. They were given dominion over all the rest of the world. I find out as a result of this, uh, they were superior to all other creatures that God created. He placed them in a literal paradise here on this earth. And as I understand it, Adam and Eve could have lived in the Garden of Eden as long as they would have kept the law which God gave them. Now that's the sad part of our little story to begin with. Out of all the things that Adam bless, was blessed with, God also gave him a law. Now a law um, from God you ought to be paying attention to. He told Adam and Eve, he said, y'all can eat any of the fruits of the tree of this garden that you want to, except this particular tree right here. He said, thou shalt not eat of this tree. And the day that you eat of this tree, thou shalt surely die. Now, I don't know how you feel about that. I believe if I had someone who had created, created me special, uh, they'd given me dominion, they'd given me a Garden of Eden to live in, I believe I would have been thankful. Was Adam and Eve thankful? Apparently not. The only law which he asked of them, we find out that they broke that law. They broke it. The Bible says it like this in Genesis 1 at verse 26. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over, over the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth on the earth. There it is, folks. He blessed them so richly and he said, now y'all can eat of any of this you want except this one particular one. Were they paying attention? Evidently not. They broke the law which he had asked of them. Now that just sort of sets the stage. Uh, it's going to be that way for a little while. And uh, let's just move on over to the children of Israel. Now the children of Israel, you know, they were richly blessed in the sight of God. In Exodus 14, chapter verse 13, Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which ye shall show you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. What about Israel? Here we find out that God delivers them out of bondage. Uh, he tells them he's going to fight their battles for them, which he did on many occasions. He have upheld the hands of Israel over enemies, which they could never have met on their own. He, furthermore, I find out that uh, to be a child of God, all you had to do was be born into the family of God. So all these Israelites, um, they were by their birthright, Children of God. Furthermore, Israel got hungry out there in the wilderness. That's a disgusting story to me. You know, they're hardly out of Egyptian bondage. And they're already whining among themselves. I wish you'd have left us back in the land of Egypt uh, where our pots were full and we had plenty to eat. And that's the way that they whined and moaned all of their existence just about. This particular time, God caused bread to fall out of the sky that they might have something to eat. Not long, they begin to whine about the bread. And he caused great coveys of quail to come into the camp that they might have meat to eat. God directed um, Israel by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Now, would you be thankful somebody's fighting your battles for you? Somebody is feeding you. Somebody is giving you direction. Well, that wasn't the case with Israel. 
I find out that Israel was constantly in idolatry and fornication and adultery. They were constantly, as we've said, uh, and one of the things that characterizes Israel in the olden days, Israel murmured and they complained. They weren't a bit thankful for all the things God had done for them. We find out at every opportunity just about, they forgot how thankful that they ought to be to God. Now that's enough of the Old Testament. Let's move over to the New Testament and let's see if we're doing any better as we get a little further over in the Bible. The one I'd like to talk about to begin with in the New Testament is um, Judas. Did you ever think about Judas? I think about Judas quite a little bit. You know, Judas was chosen as one of the apostles of Jesus. As far as I'm concerned, the greatest position that a mortal man could have. A disciple, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Uh, Judas, now here's the thing that ought, ought, you ought to think about. You know this morning I could have picked up this New Testament and we could have had the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Judas. Sure we could. He was an apostle just like the other fellows were. Is there a book of Judas? No, not at all. In spite of all the opportunities Judas had, we find out that he was willing to sell it out. In Matthew, the 26th chapter, I'm going to read beginning of verse 14. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priest and said to them, What shall you give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they coveted him for thirty pieces of silver. What about the friend of Jesus, Judas, who had all these opportunities? He's down here with the enemies of the Lord, and he's selling him out for 30 pieces of silver. The last time I looked, and this changes, you understand, with the price of silver, 30 pieces of silver was about $18. Doesn't make any difference how much it was. Uh, it was too much for one to desert the Lord and sell him out for what he was able to get. But that's exactly what Judas did. Uh, the opportunity which he had uh, ended up in his betrayal of Jesus Christ. Now, before you get you back up, hold on just a minute, because I'm going to come back by here after a while, and you may have sold out the Lord cheaper than that. That's what Judas got, wound up hanging himself in remorse. Uh, let's do this again. I find there's another man. This is sort of an insignificant person. I could simply call him the rich young ruler. But he had a great opportunity. This rich young ruler, the Bible talks about in Luke chapter 18. And uh, Jesus is going along the way. And uh, he observes this young man. And the Bible says Jesus loved him. We soon find out why. The young man come up to Jesus and he said, Master, what must I do that I might have eternal life? And Jesus said, keep the law, keep the commandments. He said, you know, I've kept the commandments all of my life. Jesus perceived what his trouble was, that he was very rich. He said, go and sell which, that which is thine, and come and follow me. Have you ever thought about that? You know, this rich young ruler could have been one of the first evangelists in the church. He might have been like Philip or Stephen and some of those other great guys. Uh, he could have gone from this point as a disciple of Jesus and done some great things. What does he do? Well, he shamefully melts back into that crowd, and that's all we ever know of him. The Bible says it in Luke 18, verse 23. When he had heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. Come and follow me, the Lord said. Uh, you could be one of these great people who established the beginning of the Lord's uh, church here on this earth. No, he cashes it in. He was very rich. You know, I think about that. I know one particular person, and I'm not going to get to call her names yet. Uh, this person, his goal in his life is to be rich. He wants to be rich. Uh, is that what we ought to be willing to pursue riches uh, and forget about everything else? The next one now, you're going to be a little bit shocked about this one. The next fella is Peter, the apostle Peter. Peter showed himself to be very unthankful on several occasions. You know, I'm really glad Peter's in his records in the Bible because it gives me a lot of courage. Peter was a great man, and I wouldn't dare take that away from him. And Peter was blessed in ways unlike any other apostle. Uh, Peter's the one that was chosen as an apostle, just like Judas was. He got that start. But Peter had an opportunity to be elevated above the ordinary apostles. And as a preacher of the gospel, I can't imagine the blessing God, uh, Jesus gave Peter. You know what he did? He told Peter, he says, I'm going to give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 16. 
What is he going to do? He's going to give Peter the keys to the kingdom of heaven. You know what the keys are? It's the gospel. You know what Peter got to do? He got to preach the gospel first to the Jews. And later on, he's called up to the house of Carnegie's the Gentile. He gets to open up the gospel first for the Gentiles. Can you think about that? Get to preach the gospel first for the Jews and the Gentiles. That's what Peter got. Peter's a one a night out on the Sea of Galilee. He saw Jesus come walking on the water. He said, Lord, if it be thee, bid me to come unto thee. Jesus said, come on. And he stepped out of the boat and began to walk on the water just like the Lord and fared very well until he began to doubt. And then he began to sink. And finally it took the hand of Jesus Christ to save his miserable life and set him afresh out on the dry land. Peter had a great opportunity, didn't he? You know, Peter's the one the night that came to take Jesus away, whips out his sword and cuts off the high priest's servant's ear. Now, wait, that's the kind of man you want, isn't it? Uh, there's Peter, and he's ready to stand up and defend you. Uh, Peter's the one when Jesus asked his disciples, Do you love me? Peter spoke up as he always was a spoken, he said, Yea, Lord, you know we love you. He said, I'll never leave you, and I'll never forsake you. Was Peter lying to Jesus? No, he wasn't. That's what he really intended. He said, I'll never leave you, and I'll never forsake you. Now remember who's doing that. That's Peter, the apostle. Uh, they may all leave you, he says, but I will never leave you, and I'll never forsake you. Well, let's go a little bit further. We find out Jesus Christ is taken away by the mob, eventually to be crucified, and Peter is following afar off. Remember Peter? He's following afar off. Jesus could use a friend about now. He could use someone uh, that was willing to stand up for him. But Peter, and listen, especially all you young people, here's a very, very good example for us. Peter gets in the wrong crowd. He's with the wrong people. Not only that, they've got him pinned down. A young lady comes around to Peter and she says, I think you're one of the disciples of Jesus. And he says, no, I'm not. I'll never forsake you and I'll never leave you. They go on and directly come back and this time they say, listen, we're pretty sure you're one of the disciples. Again, this time he curses and says, I'm not one of the disciples. They came back the third time and they say, we know you're one of them because you speak just like they do. Galilean, you see. Now Peter curses and swears and says, I don't know him. I don't know him. I don't know him. I swear I don't know him. Pitiful, wasn't it? That's what our Savior had to put up with while he was here on this earth. Peter had totally forgotten all the opportunities the Lord had offered him. Uh, he was not a, a bit thankful for all these privileges. He doesn't know the Lord now that the rubber's got on the road. He denies him. One last time, and then we're going to talk about us. I want to talk about Peter again. But this time it's Peter, James, and John. These are what the Bible referred to as the beloved disciples. It appears that Jesus loved these three men more than any of his other disciples. Uh, they're the ones that were selected to share uh, in many of the activities of Jesus. It was Peter, James, and John that got to go with Jesus out the mountain of transfiguration. There they stand there and they watch in a vision as the face of Jesus shines like the sun. They look down here and here's uh, 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 all these opportunities that they have. And, you know, they stand up and they've got this notion that they're going to build here three tabernacles. Uh, Jesus had to correct them. But now then, we find the time of Jesus is near. And uh, he goes out to the Garden of Gethsemane. And wh who would you think he'd take with him? In his most trying hour, he took with him the people that he trusted more than anybody else. He took with him Peter, James, and John. He said to the disciples, y'all wait here uh, while I go a little further and pray to my father. So Jesus went out in the garden of Gethsemane, throwed himself down on the ground and prayed the most agonizing prayer you can read about in any type of literature. Jesus says, Father, this is sad to think about, Father, my father, you can do it. You can let this cup pass me. What's the disciples doing, do you suppose? 
they're very alertly sitting out there in the edge of the garden, ready to run and tell Jesus in a minute that the mob's coming. Is that what you think? That's not what's happening. Let me read it to you. Matthew 26. I'll read over there beginning at verse um, 73. Here's what the disciples are doing. And after a while came unto him... No. Matthew chapter 26 at verse 73 uh, is our verse. And he says it like this. Uh, they come unto Jesus and he finds them asleep. What's wrong with them? They're asleep. They're sitting out there in the garden. Are they concerned about the Lord? Apparently they're not concerned. Uh, they are asleep, the Bible tells us. He wakes them up. He goes back and prays again. And he comes back. Surely they're awake now. No, they're asleep again. Uh, it's on down at verse, um, it's at verse 40 that I want to read. Matthew 26 at verse 40. Uh, the Bible says this. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep and saith unto Peter, What? Could thou not watch one hour? You know what? It seems like that they would have been concerned about the Lord, but they weren't concerned. Down in the city of Jerusalem, there's a mob beginning to boil and clamor for his blood, and they're sitting out there asleep. How do you think they could do that? How could they do that? I'll tell you how they could do it. Just like folks assembled in the assembly of the Lord's house with Jesus here with us this morning and sat here and sleep. That's the way it happens. Just like it would have back in that day and time. They weren't thankful for the fact that they had the Savior with them. As a matter of fact, uh, they could not watch one extra hour. Sad situation. Now, <clears throat> I said a minute ago not to get too excited because now we're back to us. And before we get too excited, I want to run some of these things by us and see how we're doing and whether or not we've been any more thankful. The first one I'd like to talk about, and I'm going to divide this up. We're going to talk about physical blessings or just uh, worldly blessings. In the last part of the lesson, we'll talk about spiritual blessings. The first one I want to mention is, do you ever thank God that you live in the United States of America, in this country that we're in? You know, we're in a sad situation, a lot of things in this country. This is still the best country in the world. And you and I happen to be members of it. Now, here's my first question. How is it that you are a citizen of the United States? Now, you know, once in a while I can look out over the crowd and I see people out there and I know how they came to this country. Now, I'm looking at y'all and I, I can tell you how you got here. You got here just like I did. You were born here. We were born in this country. Uh, is that something that we're ashamed of? Should not be. Is that something that we don't thank God for? We should be thanking Him for it because the odds of us being born in this country are literally astronomical. I, I've got some new figures here for you. Why weren't you born in China? Communist China. In China, and I, this is more numbers than I'm used to handling, there is 1,439,323,776 people. That's billion with a B. Why weren't you born in China? The odds were you should have been. Or how about India? India is 1,380,400,385. India, why weren't you born there? You know what the population right now is of the United States? It is a mere 331,200,651. 231 million in a world of 7.9 billion. Why weren't you born somewhere else? You can't explain. I can't explain that either. Uh, the way, I, as I said, that I got here, just like you did. Why weren't we in two-thirds of the rest of the world, which is dominated by an atheistic communism? Why is it that you and I are, are not somewhere else instead of here? We don't have to explain, and I don't think that's even necessary. It ought to be necessary, though, that we thank God that we're here instead of all these other places we could be. Are we living like Adam 
enjoying the benefits of a paradise on earth and never taking time to thank God for it? Are we like the hogs out here in the woods uh, enjoying the benefits of the acorns and never looking up to see where they come from? I'm afraid that we are in a lot of cases. Uh, let's do this again. Uh, how about the necessities of life? When I word the prayer for the congregation, I usually say something like, thank you, God, for the necessities of life. Thank you for food. That's not what I mean, though. I'm not, I don't mean thank you, Lord, for food. Do you know what food is? Food is a pancake of sort made out of cornmeal and a glass of water to drink it with. Thank you, Lord, for food. You know, millions of people on this earth go to bed hungry every night. There are millions of, of children on this earth that cry themselves to sleep. But not us. We thank, thank you, Lord, for food. And I mean that I can come to your home here in Missouri and the table is reasonably laden down with anything your hearts might desire. If it's not there, we can probably get it for you. I mean that you and I can throw away, and this is a startling fact, we can throw away more than most people have. They say the United States throws away enough feed, uh, food to feed the rest of the world. That's us. We can just throw it away. How about our, our clothing? Y'all know I have trouble with clothing. I do. Uh, I got up this morning and I went over the, uh, to, to the clothes that I brought for the meeting and I looked in there and I thought, which suit am I going to wear this morning? Which one? I, I had to think about it a minute. Uh, which shirt do I want to wear? Which tie? My young daughter buys me the nicest ties, and here's one of them. You'll get to see a bunch of them this week. Nothing happens. Uh, what about that tie Jody got me the other day? Uh, isn't that nice? And, uh, you know, ladies, and I'm not sloughing off on the ladies this early in the meeting. I know better than that. But I have women tell me sometimes, <clears throat> I go to stay in somebody's home, and they go into the closet in the back room where they're going to have me stay, and they get a hold of a closet rod like this, and they pull it just as hard as they can both ways, and they ooch me out about that much room. Now, that's not Cindy. She gave me plenty of room. About that much room, and it's hung so full of clothing you couldn't hang something else in there sideways. And I hear him say, I don't have a thing to wear. Surely you don't mean that. Uh, what you mean is you don't have anything new, maybe. Or you don't have anything that the girls haven't seen yet. You couldn't mean you don't have anything to wear. Uh, we're trying to get rid of all we got now uh, so we can get some more. Thank you, Lord, for clothing. It's amazing, isn't it? I say thank you, Lord, for shelter. That's the crudest of all three of these terms. You know what shelter is? Shelter is a sheet iron over your head in the summertime to keep the sun from baking your brains. And it is a tar paper uh, walls on a little shanty uh, to keep your north wind from freezing you to death. That's shelter. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about your home and my home where we can come in. Uh, it's dry, it's warm, it's cool. Uh, we got pipes sticking out of the walls with water running out of them. Water running out of pipes right in your house. Uh, we've got electric equipment, we've got stoves, we've got microwaves, we've got all kinds of good stuff in our shelter. I had a man come around to me one time he said, I'm going to tell you, and he was a little bit swelled up over it all. He said, I'm going to tell you where I got all my stuff. I said, okay. He said, I work for it. Is that way you got yours? You work for it? Well, I want you to tell me something. How about people that work? I'm not talking about uh, eight to five. I'm not talking about uh, uh, different types of jobs that you might hold. I'm talking about people who labor. I was at a place one time and uh, several, an hour or two before daylight, I began to hear noise. And I looked out and there's people walking up and down the street. They were going to, to work. You know what their work was? Most of them was carrying some kind of a knife. They were going out to the edge of town where there's a huge sugar cane field and they were cutting sugar cane. As soon as he got light enough to see it. Stacking it up. 
All that chaff going down their back. All of that labor they were doing. Now friends, that's work. Is that the way you got yours? I think a person ought to know better than to say that he'd earned what he has in this country. Uh, these are things that are blessings to us of God, and we need to be thankful for them. I'm afraid there's too many like Israel. They soak up the, God's, uh, the goodness of God's blessings and never take time to think about where they came from. Here's another one. This is one that um, the older I get, the more I appreciate it. You ever thank God for your family? There's a bunch of young people here, and I'm thankful for you, you folks, you young people. Uh, it is a blessing to congregation to have young people, and you all have several apparently. Uh, do you ever thank, thank God for your mama? you ever thank God for your daddy? Especially if they're Christians and they want you to be a Christian. You need to be thankful for that because not everybody has a mama or a daddy. And if you've got one of each that are Christians, you're tremendously blessed. Let me tell you a little story. I had a young lady, she's a Christian now, but when I first met her, she wasn't. She told me, she said, all of my life, my mom and daddy didn't care anything about me. They didn't care when I came and went. And they said, you know, I, I really did uh, miss that. She said, I, uh, I think that I needed some discipline. And said, here's what I'd do. I'd be out with two or three of my friends and uh, uh, about 11 or 11.30 or something, wherever we were, one of them would say, oh man, I got to get home. I got a curfew. I got to be home by 11.30. And they'd take off and said the other, other than the two, they'd say, yeah, you know, mom and daddy want me home. They'll be checking up on me. It's almost 11.30 or 12 or whatever it was. I got to go. She said, you know what I'd do? I'd just make up me a curfew. Make it up. My mom and daddy didn't care when I came or left. So in a minute or two, I'd say, yeah, I got to go. I got to get home. Mama's going to be looking for me. And she said that wasn't true. But that's what she wanted. She wanted what we think we don't want. She wanted some discipline. She wanted to be able to think that if somebody in this big wide world loved her like a mama or like a daddy, Young people, don't forget to thank God for your mother or your daddy. Also, and I want to get this in too, all you parents in the audience and grandparents, you thank God for your children, for your grandchildren. It is a great opportunity to have family, uh, children in your family. And that's something we need to be thankful for. It is something which um, I'm afraid sometimes we fail to recognize just how valuable it is. I've raised two girls, as most of y'all know. My girls are now grown. And uh, I get to thinking about them once in a while. If I could um, start over, you know what I wish I could do? I wish I had a little more money. I could have bought them nicer clothes. I wish I would have had a little more money so I could have maybe taken them places they would like to go. I wish I could have um, sent them to a better school. I wish I could have bought them all the stuff they wanted. Is that what you think? That's not right at all. You know what I wish I could do if I had them back if I had them back when they were just about that tall, I used to call them both my little pink ice cream cones because that's what they made me think of. If I could just have them back when they were about that big and pick them up and hug them one more time. Now, I'm not interested in all the stuff I could have got them, all the advantages, so-called, that they might have had. That's not what I would want. I'd like to hug them one more time. And if you mamas and daddies want to do that with your little children, you better do it now. You better do it soon because the next time you look around, that opportunity is past. Be thankful for your children while you have the opportunity. I see parents that emphasize all the wrong things. 
And the church now has to compete with a lot of things that are quite amazing to me. For instance, in the little town of Ada, Oklahoma, where I live, um, uh, there was never anything happen on Wednesday night because the whole town knew the people went to church. Uh, they would never have scheduled anything on a Sunday because the people in town went to church. That's not the case anymore. Now, if you'll allow the school, they'll occupy every extra moment your child has. And I find parents buy into that. And this is usually the parents' fault. Uh, they emphasize all the wrong things. We talk about soccer moms, and I've had women in church tell them, oh, i got a schedule. i got to go get uh, so-and-so. She's at uh, ballet lessons. i got to go get so-and-so, you know. Uh, she's at piano lessons. i got to go get someone. They're playing soccer. And they're on a run. And I'll tell you about that run. Fifteen minutes after they graduate from high school, all of that won't be worth a dime. It's over. It's through. And what did you do besides work yourself into a frenzy? Like I said, this is usually the parents' fault. What happened? What was all that about? Nothing. Except distract your children from doing something useful for them. Doing something good for them. Uh, it is something that uh, we find people are like Judas, and there's too many Judases in the church already. Uh, when it comes time to own the Lord, they forget about Him. How about your riches? You ever thank God for your riches? Again, I, I taught a lesson like this one time, and a little sister come around to me, and uh, she come up, and she was very pious about it, and she said, um, Brother Heisel, you made a mistake this morning. I said, really? Yeah, I said, you did. You said I ought to be thankful for our riches, and I don't have any. Well, my heart went out to her. I thought, here's one of them widows indeed the Bible talks about, and they're scarcer than hen's teeth, and here's one of them. She has nothing, but I suspected more. So I said, don't you own a home? Yeah, I got, I got a home. I said, don't you have air conditioning? Yeah, I, I got air conditioning. I said, don't you have rugs on the floor? Uh, yeah. I said, don't you have running water? Yeah, I got running water. Uh, I said, uh, don't you drive to church in, the, in that car out there in the yard? Yeah, I, I do. I said, you know you're rich. Now, by riches, I don't mean that you live in a house um, uh, on a hillside with $100,000 stuffed in a mattress. Or uh, that you drive a big car. That's not what I'm talking about. I mean that you have things above and beyond the call of necessity. And if you deny that, you better think again. Because this is something that you and I are blessed with to one degree or another. Uh, riches uh, have been given unto us. We've been blessed with them. But you know, if you're not very careful, your riches can become your curse. Um, I find that this is uh, Matthew 6, verse 21. The Bible says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I, I've been able to witness some um, rich people for the last 60 almost years. And you know, I've seen that riches aren't what people think they are. Matter of fact, the Bible says, they who would be rich pierce themselves through with many sorrows. They drown themselves, and on and on. It's just not a good situation. I'm thinking about a man right now that I've known for a long time. Uh, this man, uh, when he first obeyed the gospel, he was pretty older when he did. I think he was 22 or 3. He obeyed the gospel, and he became very fervent in the work of the Lord. He was one of them kind you could just count on to do anything needed to be done. Uh, he was very conscientious about his example and living like he should. Well, things rocked along. And then I went down there another time, and he had um, told me he'd taken up a new habit. He said he'd bought him a nice big bass boat and a bunch of fishing tackle, and that he'd take it up fishing. Well, you people know me, that's fine. I like to fish too. But he let this get ahead of him. It got so that on Sunday morning, after the last amen was said, if you're standing by the back door, he's liable to run over you. Uh, he and his crowd got to get down to the lake. It got so he didn't come back Sunday night. This morning, if everything's like it's been being, you know where he is? He's down at the lake. He's enjoying all those things. He thought he was missing. Now you think that's 
that's bad. Well, it depends on how you look at it. You know what I think about it? I think he better put some big lights on that boat so he can run it all day and then turn those lights on and run it all night. Because where he's going, if he doesn't change his ways, there's not going to be any boats or water. Here's what happened to him. This man, we just put him down here on this end. What happened? His riches got between him and God. Who lost? God did. And him worse than anybody. Your riches can be a curse. The rich man we read about a while ago allowed his riches to separate between him and his service to God. Uh, let's go a little bit further. I'm going to take just a few minutes. About, I'm about to the bottom line. And I'll talk about a couple of spiritual blessings. These are far more important. Uh, spiritual blessings. You ever thank God for the church? Do you know what a blessing that is? You people have this church here in Columbia. Uh, this, this is unique. You know, much to our shame, there's uh, states in this United States that don't have a faithful church. That's a, that's a shame. Uh, there are countries, whole countries around the world that do not have a faithful church. But here we are sitting here this morning as the Lord's church. That's what we are. We're all, or most of us, are members of the Lord's church. And thank God that we are. Thank God, and I, I think of this sometimes, somebody came my way and taught me about the church, about Jesus, and about the gospel, for which I am very thankful. But you know, I have people tell me how thankful they are for the church, and it's obvious they're not. Uh, as I mentioned fishing a while ago, you know, I see people that allow fishing and hunting and baseball and football and Here's the extremes. Pickle making and corn canning and horseshoeing and ballet lessons and bonanza and Halloween get between them and the church. And that's the best way you can tell how much you love the church is your attendance. Your attendance. Don't come by and tell me, I love the Lord's church. If you're not going to be here this next week or I have a very good excuse that you're not, uh, what do we do? We take an effort to support the church to hold it up, to cause it to grow. And that ought to be our chief interest. It's, a, as we said, an obvious check. Check your attendance. Can you give an extra hour's service? Well, Peter, James, and John couldn't. And I hope we can do better than that. Last of all, I save this in the last on purpose. Thank God for the gospel. People ask me, I, I was... Uh, I've been preaching, if I remember this right, and I try to forget it, so uh, 56 years, full time. Um, and people say, you've been preaching for 56 years. Uh, how can you be enthusiastic about it? How can you still want to continue preaching? I'm, I'm about to tell you. You see this little book right here? This is what I preach. This is the only book in the world that can take the most ungodly, unholy, unrighteous, sorry human being and change them into sons and daughters of God. This is the only thing to do it. Why wouldn't I be enthusiastic about it? You can't do that any other way. So as long as I'm able, I want to preach. I want to preach the gospel. Do you thank God for the gospel? You know, the, the gospel, and I, I'm going to talk about this, I hope, one night this week, uh, was a secret. It was hidden from generations. It was hidden from the Old Testament prophets. It was hidden from angels. It was not revealed until everything was just right. Jesus died upon the cross, and it was revealed. The power of God and salvation, according to Romans 1 verse 16. Thank God for the gospel of Christ. Now, <clears throat> uh, I heard, I don't know if it's still the same, Russia's in a mess too, uh, that some of the churches over in Russia, and there's still some over there in spite of all that's going on, uh, they did not have the Bible written out like this because if you got caught with it, you might spend the rest of your days digging salt in Siberia. So they had the Bible torn up into individual pages. 
And I got to thinking about that. Suppose I was over there in Russia and I was concerned enough about the gospel, I would be willing to chance to have this page right here. This page is Romans chapter 9. Uh, what would I do with it? Would I take this page home and lay it over on the coffee table and forget about it? Would I take it home and put it up on top of the refrigerator and let it draw dust? No, I wouldn't. You know what I would do with Romans chapter 9? I'd read it. I'd read it again. I'd read it again. I might read it four or five times before I got rid of Romans chapter 9 to the next person who's uh, fearless to take it. You wouldn't have to give me Romans 9 for a long time. I'd have it. Now here's my question for us. How many of us this past week picked up the Red Dirt Bible one time, just one page, for free? It's free. Nobody's going to hurt you. Nothing bad is going to happen. You read one page for free. I am convinced that there are people in the United States, there's people all over the world that have never had an opportunity to read the Bible. And I believe if they could, they'd jump on it. Now we're working to get it out there to them, but the opportunity is still ours to preach the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know, I find and this is something again that a lot of people do not seem to appreciate. Um, there's a person, and this makes me get sick in my stomach, so y'all excuse me and I have to go over here in the corner and throw up because that's what I feel like. There's a brother come around to me one time and I'm, I have a reputation for preaching what we call first principle sermons. That's B-R-C-B. That's telling people what to do to be saved. That's my reputation and I'm, I'm glad to have it because that's what I like to preach. And this guy come around to me and he said, I want to tell you something. I get so sick of that first principle rigmarole. And you know, I didn't know what to say to him. That's what it was to him. That's what this was to him. First principle rigmarole. Is that the way you think about this? Every time that I preach a sermon, I never close without extending the gospel invitation. I usually read or quote where you have to believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. I always do that. And I don't see any reason not to. Uh, if there's nobody here that it applies to, how about the rest of us? You know, I'm, I'm happy to hear some preacher stand up here and reaffirm what I believe with all my heart. And that's what I want him to do, at least remind me of what I had to do in order to be saved. It's no first principle rigmarole. And it's a pity if somebody thinks that that's the way that it is. Because that's not the way that it is. This is the opportunity God has provided us that we might be saved. In, in James 1 at verse 17, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Where did all these blessings come from? God. Everything is from above. John 3 verse 27, John Atchison said, A man can receive nothing except he be given it from heaven. Now I earned this stuff. No, you were blessed. I was blessed. It is something that we need to remember. Jesus Christ is going along the road one day and he came upon ten lepers. This is uh, uh, Luke chapter 17. And these lepers began to beg him to heal them. So he told them what to do to be healed. And they went running off down to do this. And they were all healed. And the Bible simply says Jesus tarried at the spot. He's waiting. What's he waiting for? After a while, one of these lepers who is now healed comes straggling back up to the Lord. And you know what he come back for? Basically, he came back to say, thank you, Lord for healing me. You know what Jesus said? Were there not ten? Yeah, there was ten. Where's the other nine? Oh, well, Lord, you know, they're not lepers anymore. Uh, they went home. Uh, they went to see about their job. They, they'll be back when they need you again. Did you ever have a friend, the only time you ever saw him, you knew he wanted something? 
help me too. That's not a very good kind of a friend to have. Wonder what the Lord thinks about us and the only time he hears from us or uh, we, we come to him is he knows we want something. Don't wait till then. Be thankful while you have the opportunity for the good things. And then when the bad things which are sure to come, you've got an avenue to speak to your father and ask his blessings then too. It's a great privilege that you and I have as Christians. I'm ready to close for this morning. Is there anybody here this morning that's not a Christian? We're going to offer you the opportunity to become a Christian. I've already mentioned this just a minute ago. Here it is, John 8 verse 24, Jesus said, Except you believe that I'm he, you'll die in your sins. We have to believe in Jesus. Luke 13 verse 3, Jesus said, I tell you, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. He said in Matthew 10 at verse 32, If you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father which is in heaven. And he said in Mark 16 verse 16, He that believeth, look here now, and is baptized, shall be saved. You've got to hear that again. I hear it every time. Yeah, you're richly blessed. If you never have obeyed it, why don't you do so? Is there a child of God here and you need to make some correction in your Christian life? We're going to offer you the opportunity while we stand and while we sing.